quickly the knight rose. He drew his sharp sword and struck the dragon's head so fiercely that it seemed nothing could withstand the blow. The dragon's crest was too hard to take a cut, but he wanted no more such blows. He tried to fly away and could not because of his wounded wing. Loudly he bellowed. The like was never heard before. And from his body, like a wide devouring oven, sent a flame of fire that scorched the knight's face and heated his armor red hot. Faint, weary, sore, burning with heat and wounds, the knight fell to the ground, ready to die, and the dragon clapped his iron wings in victory, while the lady, watching from afar, fell to her knees. She thought that her champion had lost the battle. But it happened that where the knight fell, an ancient spring of silvery water bubbled up from the ground. In that cool water, the knight lay resting until the sun rose. Then he, too, rose to do battle again. And when the dragon saw him, he could hardly believe his eyes. Could this be the same knight, he wondered, or another who had come to take his place? See? There's St. George, and there's the spring that bubbled up from the ground to cool his red-hot armor and help rejuvenate him like a gift from the earth. The knight brandished his bright blade, and it seemed sharper than ever, his hands even stronger. He smote the crested head with a blow so mighty that the dragon reared up like a hundred raging lions. His long, stinging tail threw down high trees and tore rocks to pieces. Lashing forward, it pierced the knight's shield, and its point stuck fast in his shoulder. He tried to free himself from that barbed sting. But when he saw that his struggles were in vain, he raised his fighting sword and struck a blow that cut off the end of the dragon's tail. Heart cannot think what outrage and what cries, with black smoke and flashing fire, the beast threw forth, turning the whole world to darkness. Gathering himself up, wild for revenge, he fiercely fell upon the sunlight the fell upon the sun-bright shield and gripped it fast with his paws. Three times the knight tried and failed to pull the shield free. Then, laying about him with his trusty sword, he struck so many blows that fire flew from the dragon's coat like sparks from an anvil, and the beast raised one paw to defend himself. Striking with, mighty, with might and main, the knight severed the other paw, which still clung to the shield. See the dragon grabbed onto his shield. Now from the furnace inside himself, the dragon threw huge flames that covered all the heavens with smoke and brimstone so that the knight was forced to retreat to save his body from the scorching fire. Again, weary and wounded, it was his long fight he fell. With gentle... Una, when gentle Una saw him lying motionless, she trembled with fear and prayed for his safety. But he had fallen beneath a fair apple tree, its spreading branches covered with red fruit, and from that tree dropped a healing dew that the deadly dragon did not dare to come near. Once more the daylight faded and night spread over the earth. Under the apple tree the night slept. It looks like each night the earth is healing St. George. Then dawn chased away the dark. A lark mounted up to the heaven. And up rose the brave knight with all his hurts and wounds healed, ready to fight again. When the dragon saw him, he began to be afraid. Still he rushed upon the knight, mouth gaping wide to swallow him whole. And the knight's bright weapon taking advantage of that open jaw, ran it through with such strength that the dragon fell dead. Breathing his last in smoke and cloud, like a mountain he fell and lay still. The knight himself trembled to see that fall, and his dear lady did not dare to come near to thank her faithful knight until she saw that the dragon would stir no more. 
Now our ship comes into port. Furl the sails and drop anchor. Safe from storm, Una is at her journey's end. See, there's the knight, and the dragon is no more. The watchman on the castle wall called out to the king and queen that the dragon was dead. And when the old king saw that it was true, he ordered the castle's great brass gates to be opened, so that the tidings of peace and joy might spread through all the land. Trumpets sounded the news that the great beast had fallen. Then the king and queen came out of the city with all their nobles to meet the Red Cross Knight. Tall young men led the way, carrying laurel branches to lay at the hero's feet. Pretty girls wore wreaths of flowers and made music on tambourines. The children came dancing, laughing, and singing with a crown of flowers for Una. They gazed in wonder at the victorious knight. But when the people saw where the dead dragon lay, they dared not come near to touch him. Some ran away, some pretended not to be afraid. One said the dragon might still be alive. One said he saw fire in its eyes. Another said the eyes were moving. When a foolish child ran forward to touch the dragon's claws, his mother scolded him. How can I tell, she said. Those claws might scratch my son or tear his tender hand. At last some of the bolder men began to measure the dragon to prove how many acres his body covered. The old king embraced and kissed his daughter. He gave gifts of gold and ivory and a thousand thanks to the dragon slayer. But the knight told the king never to forget the poor people and gave the rich gifts to them. Then back to the palace all the people went, still singing, to feast and to hear the story of the knight's adventures with Una. See, there's St. George shaking the king's hand with Princess Una. When the tale ended, the king said, Never did living man sail through such a sea of deadly dangers. Since you're now safely come to shore, stay here and live happily ever after. You have earned your rest. But the brave knight answered, No, my lord, I have sworn to give knight service to the fairy queen for six years. Until then I cannot rest. The king said, I have promised that the dragon slayer should have Una for his wife and be king after me. If you love each other, my daughter is now yours. My kingdom shall be yours when you have done your service for the fairy queen and returned to us. Then he called Una, who came no longer wearing her black cloak and her veil, but dressed in a lily-white gown that shimmered like silver. Never had the knight seen her so beautiful. Whenever he looked at the brightness of her sunshiny face, his heart melted with pleasure. Okay. There's Una and the Red Cross Knight. So Una and the Red Cross Knight were married and lived together joyfully. But the knight did not forget his promise to serve the fairy queen. And when she called him into service, off he rode on brave adventures, until at last he earned his name, St. George of Merry England. That is how, when jolly sailors come into a quiet harbor, they unload their cargo, men ship, and take on fresh supplies. Then away they sail on another long voyage, while we are left on shore, waving goodbye and wishing them Godspeed. That is the full, long story of St. George and the Dragon. I hope you guys enjoyed it.